I absolutely love that clip. And I thought it would be really, really lovely over the next couple of weeks that you have got to put up with me that we might unpack the letters of Peter. Um, sometimes we, we cut away in the back and they're kind of short. We miss them. And I didn't want you to miss it. We've just done a beautiful series on Acts. And uh, we're going to head right into the letters of Paul in the new year when, when, the, when the guys are back from their break. So in February, we're going to be getting into that. And I just thought I'd take the opportunity to look at Peter. Because have you ever wondered about the relationship between the Saviour and Peter? What it must have been like? to go from where he was, a humble fisherman, into the man that demanded to be crucified upside down because he couldn't bear to be the same as the Saviour. I forgot to mention to uh, Mikey that the deacons, because of COVID, won't be collecting offering. Obviously, there's an offering box right at the feet of, is it Lucas up the back? <laughs> um, so when you're leaving, you can leave your offering there. I also wanted to let you know that we are being COVID safe with our people on stage. Um, we, we're gathering in family groups. They're allowed to do that because they spend time at home together anyway. But in between the families, there's a break. So um, I want you to know that we're being COVID safe, and I hope you are too. So let's, let's have a look at Peter. What Jesus did with this man was incredible. He walks past him, and Andrew actually, his brother, says, come and see the Saviour, because he was an apostle of John the Baptist. And so come and see the Saviour. So Peter kind of, you know, checks him out, and that guy that kind of sheepishly came up to Jesus was part of the transformation of the world. And it's amazing. And I don't want you to miss how much Peter contributed. So the book's probably written about AD 62 to 65. And Nero had taken over and persecution had broken out everywhere. And so Peter decides he's going to write a letter of encouragement to a bunch of people who were spread all the way through Turkey, so Asia Minor, as it was called, west, south, all around that bay area in Turkey. And so he sends the letter out to the, the, the Christians that had spread out, Jews, Jewish Christians, new converts to Christianity through um, our, our non-Jewish group and he sends this let these letters out to them to encourage them because of the persecution and he's writing from what he calls Babylon but we know it as Rome and um, this this guy is we've just seen probably the the martyrdom of, of Paul would have been beheaded by this time and so in this encouragement in this awful time when persecution was just disappointing people and they were feeling like has God seen us? He embarks with these beautiful letters of encouragement. And I figured we have been through 2020 and it was perilous. <laughs> um, I don't know. I know what it was like for you to be at home. And we worked at home and we taught from home. I, I, we, we started our school of ministry. And I think the students have seen more of my house than they wanted to um, because that's where they were taught from. Um, we have preached. You have seen my back room when I've been trying to put music together when we weren't allowed to leave the house. And it was every week we were learning something new about how to do church in that environment. And before that, we had the fires. It wasn't a fun year. It was kind of one of those years you always want to forget. Um, Kelly, my friend, sent me a, a little thing about numbers and it was the number 13 going, I'm a bad number. And then 666 comes up, no, no, I'm a really bad number. And then 2020 just goes, ha, <laughs> you guys mad, you know. So 2020 has been a year that we probably wish we didn't have. So I figured the letters of encouragement that Peter wrote to the people in Turkey in Asia Minor was probably a good thing for us to look at at this and to pause and go, Silla. God still sees us. 
We have been led through a perilous time, but God still sees us and loves us and wants us and can't wait to be with us. And he calls them, the believers, victorious overcomers. And they wouldn't have felt anything like victorious overcomers when they received this letter. But just as Jesus had always done to Peter, he was predicting what was going to happen with this hope that you have, with what he's done for you, with the sprinkling of his precious blood over you, you are a victorious overcomer. So I'm here this morning to tell you, despite 2020, you are victorious overcomers. Do you feel like it? (laughs) I hope so. I hope so. So let's look at this guy for just a moment. We said he was humble, led to Jesus by his brother, to be the three in the innermost circle with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And then failing dismally, as that video pointed out, it was Peter who, in his stubbornness and impulsiveness and his pridefulness, struggling with legalism, denied Jesus at that opportune moment. Took a swipe at poor old Malcolm. I think he's trying to chop his head off. But if you've tried to work out exactly which, how he did that, um, you realise that he was very awkward. And he was not a good swordsman either. Um, so if you've actually... I'm a bit of an... Act, I, I got Josh's samurai sword out. You would laugh what happens at my place sometimes when I'm trying to reenact some of this stuff in my head. And I'm pitching his left eye... Ear with, and he would have had to been... There's no way he was aiming for the ear. I'd say Malchus ducked like that and Peter was going for his head and just... um, And even Jesus fixed up that mess with the gentle touch of his hand. So poor old Peter um, had, you know, ups and downs. But do you know what? He was the first to preach the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem. The very first time Jesus ever talks about the ecclesia, the beginning of the church, was with Peter. Gee, if my name was mentioned together with the building of what we sit in now as a community of believers, I'd be pretty chuffed that he talked about it first with Peter. And he says to him, all right, Peter, I'm going to build my church, not on Peter, because we know the difference between Petros, Petra, the pebble. Yeah, we've, we've heard that before. Okay, so it was, he was building his church on Peter's statement. Who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. On that statement, on that foundation, that's what I'm going to build my church on. And then Peter, we find him addressing thousands. Now, I am not a public speaker. I just do what God calls me. But can you imagine having 3,000 in in one sermon um, accredited to being transformed into believers of the living God? That would be a pretty good thing. You would call yourself a pretty good evangelist, wouldn't you, if you could do that? Peter did. After Pentecost, gets up, does a sermon, 3,000 people converted right there and then. And then Jesus in Luke 22, 31 to 32 predicts the job that Peter was going to have for the future. If you've got a moment, you can turn there with me, Luke 22, 31, 32, and it's in red in your Bibles, and it says, Peter, my dear friend, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Satan has obtained permission to come and sift you like wheat to test your faith. And Peter knew he'd been tested, I'm sure. But you know what, Peter? I've prayed for you. And Peter, that you would stay faithful to me no matter what comes. Remember this. After you have turned back to me and have been restored, make it your life mission to strengthen the faith of your brothers. And I'm going to add, and sisters. 
because brethren back then meant humanity, the people of the community. And so Jesus prophesies over Peter, your job is going to be to strengthen the faith. And so when we go through Acts, I'm sure you remember the first 12 chapters of Acts, they mention Peter more than anywhere else. And a huge portion of grace is on these letters because Peter had felt firsthand the grace of the living God. He'd received it in his own restoration. So when he's writing it, he, he, he uses a greeting that is a mixture between what they used to do in, in, in... The Greeks used to do, like, glory. That was their greeting. And, of course, the Jews always did shalom. So he mixes it up and he goes, peace and grace. And he always puts grace first because there's no way... You can receive peace unless you've had God's grace, and he knew that. Well, let's look at Peter. He was married, and I just found out recently, you know, that, you know, he was crucified probably in about AD 67 or 68. Um, But I was reading some history books, and it turns out that his wife chose the same fate as a husband to be crucified upside down. So we don't hear much about her, but we hear that from that, (laughs) that she must have been a faithful follower. She was always in the background praying. Like he moved the whole family. They um, came from Bethsaida and they moved to Capernaum to be closer to Jesus. Like she must have been very supportive in a relationship. So um, Jesus chose well this family to support his ministry. And then we find that um, he was the first disciple to be called to the non-Jewish community. So when he was when he took the invitation with Cornelius, um, and he saw the vision, of course, with the sheep coming down with all the unclean animals, take and eat. And he goes, "No, never." And he's going, "No, this is about taking the message and not being afraid to eat and to mix and to love and to share the gospel with um, the non-Jewish community." So it was it was. Peter that broke the new ground. So we know that Paul was the first missionary to go out to all those places, extensions. But if Peter hadn't broke that new ground to start with, there's no way Paul, being not as well known, would have ever um, had enough power to, um, to break the bonds of having to be circumcised and being completely Jewish to be a follower of Jesus. So it was Peter who broke that new ground. And then we find that after he was released from prison that time, that he ended up in Antioch of Syria, overseeing the beginnings of that church. And then, of course, um, he stands up at the Jerusalem Council to defend all the um, Gentile Christians that were coming and make it, let's make it easy for them to come to Jesus, and then James puts his stamp of approval on it. Um, And I I love what we see in this, that this guy grows into something that is just remarkable. We heard in Acts that his very shadow cast would heal the sick. People would wheel all their sick and diseased and demon-possessed people out, and as he was going to the temple, if his shadow touched them, they would be healed. So this... This guy that had had these ups and downs ends up in an amazing place and we see that God is incredibly patient with his leaders and um, we should be too. We know that he was probably not as well educated as what he should have been to be writing the beautiful work that he has. So Silvanus was his scribe. Oh, I could do with a scribe sometimes. That would be so good, wouldn't it? And the letter is written beautifully. And then Peter talks of God as the loving father, the creator. And I I get the picture that being close to Jesus would have made his relationship amazing in that he witnessed those times when Jesus went away and just spent time with his father. So Peter's got a very clear relationship with God the Father, that beautiful synergy of father, son. So he refers to him as God the Father. And um, he calls him redeemer and judge. He's portraying great power to who God is. And then he refers to Jesus in a very Hebrew way, the anointed one, always. He's the one we've always waited for. There's no doubt in Peter's mind that that's who Jesus was, the anointed one. 
And then he reveals the Holy Spirit as absolutely vital in the ongoing Christian life. So, so Peter has a really clear vision of the, of the Godhead, the Trinity, with God the Father being the loving, gorgeous Father who created in the power. And then Jesus, who was the anointed one, sent, and then the Holy Spirit as a vital companion to the ongoing Christian life, our absolute source of power. And he had no doubt at all the power of the blood of Jesus. He uses that terminology, the sprinkling, which of course came... You know, when Moses brought the, the commandments down from Sinai, he had uh, um, oxen killed and he would sprinkle the people to represent the beginning of the covenant. Um, so he, he understood and the, and the readers of his letters would have understood this power of the sprinkling of the blood. So I love Peter because he was the little rock or the little pebble who put his trust in a boulder <laughs> and um, encouraged people to build their lives on the rock. And it's Peter's story, I think, that inspired that song that we sing with the kids, the wise man built his house upon the rock <laughs> and the foolish man built his house upon the sand because Peter learnt that the only place to put your house, <laughs> the only place to build anything, the only place to put our church is in the rock that is Jesus and we need strong foundations. And I think in this time when these people were thinking, God doesn't see us anymore, we are invisible, the persecution is terrible, or it could be us, we've been through COVID, we've been stuck at home, people are dying, it's frightening. Um, does God see us? He absolutely does. And if you will put your faith in the rock and if you will build your house in that foundation, you'll be okay. You'll come out the other side. So we see this movement um, from disciple to apostle to missionary. And I was thinking about that. A disciple is a follower. So when you first are converted, you become a disciple, right? And then apostle stands alone and is ready to hold the fort, so to speak, to foresee the needs of the church, to be a blessing and planted in the church. And then, of course, the missionary goes out and takes the gospel out. And I think sometimes in our church we miss um, the importance of moving from disciple to apostle to evangelist or to missionary. Um, and we stop. We're happy when we just get the follower, but we need to keep going. Churches die if we don't go through the three processes of becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming a standalone, built in the foundations, ready to be a statement in the church itself, and the missionary that takes the gospel out. Um, and, and that's so for us too. Exactly what happened to Peter needs to happen inside each one of us so that the church doesn't die. I always say this, we're only one generation away from the church dying out. If we don't bring our kids up to be followers of Jesus Christ, um, the church will die out. And we're like, who wants that to happen? That's why we are so passionate about our young people. You know, our teens are the best in the universe. I'm sorry all you online viewers, but, you know, our teens at Lilydale the best you can come and join us if you want but we are the best so I love Jesus because he changes names because Peter was called Simon and that means one who hears that's good we all like to hear but then he said but you will become you will become Petros you will become A rock. And as the video said, a heart change means that this changes. So after the resurrection, when all the when all of the fears of Peter came out, and he would he would feel this, he would feel the people's pain. That on that shore, when Jesus said to him, Do you love me? And it's kind of awkward because Jesus asks him three times. You kind of feel it, do you feel a bit awkward for Peter? Do you love me? Yes, I love you. And he would feel awkward because he knew he'd failed him. He said, yeah, yeah, I love you. Feed my lambs. He said, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. 
And then something clicked in this brain of Peter's. The sound that every fallen leader would want to hear. Jesus was handing over his most precious possessions to Peter, those that he had died for. If you want to feel really passionate about people, die for them. And Jesus had, and he was handing this to Peter. This fallen leader was being raised up. So he knew exactly what it was like to have people feeling so sad and desperate. But he loved Jesus and he was going to do everything he could. And that prophecy that went over him, you be the guy that encourages the brethren. You be that guy. And Peter's letters are about being that guy. That guy that is found his, his hinges, his foundations in the rock. And that he can encourage anybody because he knows no matter what, God is there. He's watching you know, Jesus had told him exactly what was going to happen to him, that he was going to be older when he passed away and when he died, when he gave his life up. So who else but Peter could absolutely be dead to the world, sound asleep, chained between two guys in a prison? Jesus had told him what was going to happen. He was just going to rest in him. He, he was just going to do whatever Jesus said. He just trusted him. And then he wanders, you know, down the street, knocking on the... He was just the most incredible dude. And Jesus must have just loved him to be taken from this brash, bold, crazy guy into what he became. And so let's just read a, a little bit of the opening words of what Peter says. So I'm in First Peter 1, 1. And it says, from Peter, an apostle of Jesus, the anointed one to the chosen ones who have been scattered across the broad like seed into the nations, living as refugees, to those in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and throughout the Roman provinces of Asia and Bithynia. <clears throat> Pardon me. You are not forgotten. For you have been chosen and destined by our Father God the Holy Spirit has set you apart to be the holy ones, obedient followers of Jesus Christ, who have been gloriously sprinkled with his blood. May God's delightful grace and peace cascade. Don't you love that? Cascade over you many times over. It sounds verbose, but Peter's going, you know what? Don't forget. Don't forget who you are and whose you are the beautiful words of encouragement. And from those, you think there's four points just in those two verses. You've been chosen. You've, you've been chosen. You're God's people. You know, the fact that he sent his son to die for humanity, he chose. Do you know how many plan Bs God could have came up with when we fell as humanity? He could have done a million other things other than redeem us like he did. Chosen, every one of you, chosen. It's just your job to say yes, to reach out. It's like God has sent the rope out. It sits there for everybody. But you can't be saved unless you reach up and grasp, grasp it for yourself. So you've all been chosen. The rope is there for each person. So these people are saying, you're chosen. And then in Romans 8, 28, it says, chosen to grow into the image of God. What a beautiful thought. You're chosen to grow into the image of God. He never leaves us where we are. He never does. He takes us. We're at transition. Um, and we go through that. You are chosen. The next point was you're known completely. He knows every circumstance. He knows every lonely night. He knows every fear in your heart. He knows you so well. So whenever you think that you've had a tough year and nobody knows but you what you've been through, that's an absolute lie. Don't ever let it sink into your heart. It's not true. God knows everything about you and knows every struggle, every pain. We are constantly growing is my third point in that. He doesn't, as I said, doesn't leave us where we were. He always moves us. Look at Peter's movement. Disciple, apostle, missionary. 
He moves us. He grows us. Look at what he was to become. Jesus looked at him and he said, this is what you're going to be. You're going to be the encourager of the faith. You're going to be the guy who always encourages people. I want to be known as the guy who always encourages people, don't you? Well, when you're rooted in the rock, you can be. It's awesome. And then the last point of that little bit is you are blessed increasingly when he falls over himself. May you be blessed. May you feel it. Don't be afraid. We're going to continue to go through Peter's letter of encouragement over the next couple of weeks. You've got Jaden next week, and I, I haven't told him he's got to preach on Peter, so that's cool. But we're going to have a look at these two letters. We've, we've set it up. We've seen this amazing guy and his transformation and where he's been. Um, have a little look through First Peter this week as, as we sort of think about where he's going to go with this. His encouragement to doubting, frightened people. And take it into your heart. Because you know what? I love John's words when he said, if we want to write down everything that Jesus did and everything he wanted, you know, we would have to use the sky as parchment, we'd have to use the sea as ink. So I believe that every word in that scripture is vital to our survival as Christians. So it's really easy. <laughs> And I'm going to invite the musicians up now. Um, it's really easy for us to, to get into that habit of, of looking at the Bible and having our little favourite bits. But there's something I've learnt. Every tiny book, whether it's Jude, whether it's First, Second Peter, wherever it is in the Bible, God has got a treasure for you. And I just can't help but think that Peter was given to us as a gift, the guy who's been transformed, that's been taken from a weakling, somebody with a weak chin, we'd call them. My mum used to say, you know, those weak chin kind of guys who can't kind of take it on the chin. A guy with a weak chin to an absolute man of rock. <laughs> if, God, if Jesus nicknamed you Rocky, would you be happy? We always picture that kind of Rocky. So he's going... It's still, it's still a tough kind of name, isn't it? To go from someone who just listens to someone who makes the statement that we build the ecclesia on. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he can do that for all of us. And he can transition us from disciple to apostle to missionary. And never before in the history of mankind have we needed to speak our faith out when there's persecution, when there's trouble, when there's fear, is the best time to stand on the mountain and shout, he is Lord and I am fearless because of it. I've been given the foundation of the rock. I will not give it up. My heart will not fail me. I am chosen. I am known. I am changing daily to be more like him. And I am blessed. And I want that to be your statement for this week. God bless you.